everybody, here we are. So thank you, thank you, thank you everyone for joining us this evening. As we know here in New Jersey, um, this was supposed to be Nerd Camp 4.0 this year in May and it was not to be, but we are running some virtual panels and um, we are hoping that our teachers and most importantly our students in New Jersey will be the beneficiaries of all of the great expertise that we're going to hear from authors here today. So I'm going to introduce our authors very quickly. Uh, we have Rajani Laraka. Did I pronounce it correctly? Because you I got it. Right. Excellent. You nailed it. Like Una. With a first name like Una, you know how important <laughs> it is. Right? And <laughs> Rajani is the author of Midsummer's Mayhem and Much Ado About Baseball. So, I mean, already I can tell she went to Shakespeare camp too. Um, <laughs> So we're soul sisters. I wish I had gone to Shakespeare <laughs> camp. That sounds delightful. <laughs> can I go to Shakespeare you camp <laughs> yes. the, by yes. you? The American yeah. Shakespeare Company runs, uh, oh no, I'm sorry, not the American Shakespeare Company. It's Shakespeare and Company in Lenox, Massachusetts. They, mm. did, a, they did one for teachers back in the day uh, before I had kids. So this one time at Shakespeare camp. Whole other panel. Nah. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> Joshua F. Levy, who is the author of Seventh Grade versus the Galaxy and Forthcoming, Eighth Grade versus the Machines. How are you? And thank you for lifting up your book, Visual Aid. Um, oh, of course. Um, and, and yeah, you got Joshua perfect, and Josh is fine also. <laughs> and I, and the middle initial, S, right? I know, the, yeah, it's a tough one. It, it stands for Superman. Okay, okay. And, and it's going to be one of those groups, isn't it? Okay, okay. <laughs> So, and then we have Nicole Malaby, who is the author of Hurricane Season and also in the role of Brie Hutchins. And then you've got a couple more coming out, Nicole, How to Become a Planet in 2021. And this is our rainbow in 2021 also. Yeah. So, yes. Nicole's the quiet one, right? Or no? no? <laughs> just, just for now. I'll just for now. <laughs> Fired up. And then Naomi Milliner, who is the author of Super Jake and the King of Chaos. There it is. There it is. There it is. All right. So one of the things that, um, that I think comes up oftentimes in, at Nerd Camp is we want to be better teachers of writing for our students. But here's the thing. Most of the time, most English language arts teachers, like expository writing is our bread and butter. But then, you know, the Common Core State Standards came along and we were like, we have to teach narrative writing like robustly and not just this like once a year thing. So we found that Nerd Camp kind of aligned with that need for teachers in such a meaningful way because we could learn from people who do this for a living how to help students who are writing fiction. Um, so in particular, we want to talk a little bit about the fact behind the fiction and start a little bit with uh, the research process. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about what your research process looks like as a writer, and particularly a writer of fiction? And you know, what, what do you do? What steps do you follow? Or do you even have steps? So who wants to start? I'll dive in first. All righty. Um, for me, I, so I'm what they call a pantser, so I kind of write without any plans whatsoever. Um, so by the time I'm done with the draft, it's kind of a hot mess. So I have to go back and then rework all the, you know, make sure that the plot makes sense, that there is a plot. And um, that's usually when I will go in and actually fill in all the research that I need to do. Um, for hurricane season, uh, the whole background with with Fig is she ends up kind of uh, becoming a little bit obsessed with Vincent Van Gogh. So I needed to know a lot about Vincent Van Gogh, um, but I didn't actually really look that far into it other than the surface things I already knew until I was working on revisions. And that's when, you know, before I dove into the revisions, I read a lot of uh, biographies about Van Gogh, watched a lot of movies, um, and, then, and then I filled everything in. So that's kind of what the process is like for me, um, so that the research kind of aids the story that I want to tell more so than bog it down. I can jump in too. So I think for me, it depends on how much I know about the things I'm writing about ahead of time. So there's some things that are lived experience for me, so I don't really necessarily have to research so much of that. But, um, so for example, in Midsummer's Mayhem, uh, the main character loves to bake and she likes to bake with kind of interesting combinations of herbs and spices. And she also likes to take 
desserts that are kind of one kind of dessert and make them into baked goods. So for me, a lot of the research was hands-on research, like making cupcakes and cookies and stuff like that. And that was really hard. <laughs> it's way more fun than uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was well it was it was interesting I mean I, I think that um it, I've never developed recipes like that before and with baking you have to be very precise unlike with cooking where I'm like ah just throw some stuff in there and it'll be fine um so that was fun it was fun and it took a lot more kind of labor and um it took a lot of coaxing people to taste things uh than I expected um with much ado about baseball um it is set in the summer on a kid's baseball team. Now, I have been the mother of a child on a kid's baseball team. So I experienced that from that side. But for me to kind of tap into what it was actually like to play on a baseball team, I actually had to interview my son and my husband a lot. Um, and, and then once I started writing chapters, I was like, okay, like just check only the baseball lingo. Like, I don't care what you think about the rest of the story. Like just make sure that the baseball lingo is correct. And they, they found some things that they were like, oh no, no, they, we would never say that. And I was like, oh, okay, well that, that's, that's good. Um, and then, so there's an unannounced book coming next year, um, where, which involves some medical issues and I'm a doctor. So there are a lot of things that I kind of knew the general um, kind of outline of what is going on. Um, but I had to do some research and I did some research online and then I actually um, had, I, I sent questions to a colleague who was a specialist in the field that I was looking at. And that was a really um, interesting experience too, because at least I knew what questions to ask and then I could understand the answers that he gave me. It's interesting when you talk about, you know, the, the two very different types of research there, you know, so there's, there's action research that you have to do where you're actually trying out recipes in the kitchen, what have you. Um, and then there's also that interpersonal outreach type of research. And I think our students don't necessarily think of either of those sometimes, right? When they think about research for a book, they think about like, what are the databases or what have you. But that sounds really exciting. And it reminded me of um, when you were talking about your baking research um, from the desk of Zoe Washington, because yes. there's the whole, there's all the cupcakes in that one. So that yes. must have been fun research too for, um, for that author whose name escapes me, but anybody feel free to shout it Janae out. Janae Marks. She's Thank wonderful. Thank you. Yes. yes. Okay. So, <laughs> um, I guess my experience was more like Rajani's in that I had to do both ends of it. Uh, my character is a magician and my youngest, my oldest son was a magician too but I didn't know much about it myself. So what my character wants to do, his big dream is to go to this thing called Magic Fest and meet his hero, Magnus the Magnificent. So to get to Magic Fest, I had to research what Magic Fest was all about. It's sort of an amalgamation of a lot of different real magic festivals and competitions around the country. So I had to, uh, I was writing people who organized them in Florida and Miami, and I was researching other ones all over the country and talking to the people and asking questions and they wrote back and that was kind of fun. And then I had to, my editor said, well, now that you've, you've finished, you're not really done. I was like, wait, what? <laughs> because she said, I think it'd be really fun if you, would put, if you would put the magic tricks that are in the story at the back of the book so the kids can learn them and perform them. And I'm like, uh, that sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah, great. So then I had to learn how to do them myself, which I didn't know too well. My son helped me. I watched videos like Rajni, reached out to people, and then I had to practice them and be sure I could actually do them before I could write them do down. Sorry? Can you do them? I could <laughs> at one time. I wouldn't want to do it so. <laughs> But I love that, you know, even the back matter of a book, right? So it might, you yeah. know, the, to, the thought to include that for the reader in the back matter, you know, and that there would be people who are interested right? Like okay. even recipes for cupcakes or recipes for baked okay. goods or what have you. I think Celeste Ng, everything I never told you has the, their, the playlist on the recipes. So, um, all right. Um, how about you, Josh? What does research look like for you? Well, I will say that I don't think about seventh grade versus the galaxy as super hard sci-fi that I absolutely need to be so accurate that a physicist would give it the thumbs up. I'm okay that that some of the central elements of of the sci-fi-ness of the book are total MacGuffins. The the light speed, the time travel, some of it is so absurd that I'm 
consciously poking fun at it. And, and, I, and I'm, I'm fine with it and I embrace it in part because it, it's a little bit inspired by the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy mode of, of sci-fi storytelling. However, that isn't to say that I, I didn't do quite a bit of research for this book and, and also for the next one, because I, I do want to make sure that the things that are still outside the realm of possibility here, they're one thing. But the things that we know, I don't want to get wrong. So for example, if the kids are from a planet or a moon in our solar system, they can't live in houses on Jupiter because they go through the gas. It doesn't, doesn't make any sense. Right? Jupiter isn't their home. So I, they're, the kids are from Ganymede because it's a solid moon. It's the largest moon around Jupiter. And I really did think carefully about what happens where. And, and the vast majority of the research, and, and this is something that, um, but I think Nicole said something along the lines of that, that really um, struck a chord with me, being also a pantser and sort of writing the story and the research coming in along the way, and, and along the way, filling in smaller gaps um, by making sure that if a kid references some uh, moon, that it makes sense that, that that thing that they're referencing would be on the moon. Just as one example, there's um, a Six Flags on Io, which is another moon of Jupiter. And Io is a volcanic moon, and there's a lot happening there. And so I thought it would be the most fun place to, to have a roller coaster. Um, and so again, you know, while while it's not necessarily grounded in reality, I was so delighted to do the research I did. Um, and and I, I think there's a lot of breadcrumbs there for a kid that's interested in astronomy and science and things like that. There was also something that Josh did that ended up inspiring something I wrote in my third book. He oh, I was hoping we would talk about this. Yes, I always love to talk about this. So Josh, do you want to explain it? or? Do you sure, I'll, I'll tell my part and then you tell your part. <laughs> So I don't even remember where, where we were. We were talking about this idea. And, and, and it happens to be that some of the research I did involved me calling what I discovered was a totally real thing, which is the Natural History Museum in New York City's Planetarium Astronomy Hotline. And you call a number, and there's an astronomer who picks it up and answers all your questions about space. And it's awesome. I, I still have saved voicemails because sometimes when you can't reach them, they'll call you back <laughs> and explain to you all the things that, that you, you wanted to know and asked on their own machine. And it's awesome. I think I mentioned it with Nicole, and, and I'll let her take it from there. Yeah, we were, we were out for coffee, and he mentioned it. Oh, yeah. I thought it was the coolest thing I've ever heard that you can just call up this hotline that I ended up writing it into talking about revisions, uh, how I work. Um, I was working on revisions of my third book, uh, How to Become a Planet, and the main character ends up calling this hotline throughout the book, trying Yay. to get answers about her life, basically. Um, but so it was because of Josh's research that my, my third book has this huge plot now. But, I am yeah. humbled and honored. <laughs> so amazing. <laughs> amazing. Here's my, you know what I, that, now I'm going to bird walk a little. This question was not on my list, but since you all got on that kind of conversation, um, you mentioned, you know, going out for coffee, you know, kind of talking with each other, what have you as a community of writers. Um, and I guess that's called like soft time, right? The time when you're not writing or you're not focused in on revision or whatever. <laughs> Like what soft time, I, I know for, my husband is not a writer, but he gets some of his best ideas in the shower. He's going to be so glad I shared that with everyone. <laughs> but like, what, what does your kind of soft time look like when you're not, you know, in that writing zone, but you know that if you don't do this, it's, you know, you need to do this in order for your writing to be good. Am I making sense with that question? Yeah, I, I like to think that rewatching the Clone Wars cartoon <laughs> helps me <laughs> write my own sci-fi series, and that may or may not be true. But um, you know, it, it, research and stories are are everywhere, and and you really never know when something is gonna inspire something in in your own writing for sure. And get you curious, right? To get you in that yes. curious spot, like what Nicole was talking about in terms of like, I didn't even know that existed, and then that ends up in her book, right? <laughs> So for me, it is, it involves um, exercise, um, including walking my dog, which is a very nice, like, 
um, experience because I usually walk, especially nowadays, with another member of my family and we just look ahead, you know, aren't necessarily looking at each other, talk about whatever, watch the dog be cute. Um, that plus showers, which are, you know, necessary. <laughs> and, um, and like Josh and Nicole were talking about, for me, uh, talking to other writers is an essential part. And, and we, ne we don't necessarily have to be talking about what we're working on, but just talking to somebody else gets my ideas flowing and uh, definitely helps. And I'm, um, I'm a planter, so I do tend to plot things ahead of time, but I also leave room for um, stuff to happen. And so a lot of times, um, if, I, uh, if I am finding uh, myself stuck in a plot, I will um, talk to someone uh, a friend of mine, preferably while walking. Mm -hmm. And then that helps me kind of saying out loud what I'm thinking helps me get unstuck. Any other ideas for soft time or the things that could help? Because I think in in the classroom, it's so hard sometimes when I'm trying to help a student writer because you're on the clock. Well, obviously now we are not on the clock, but I hope that one day soon we'll be back on the clock. Um, but to kind of give them the advice of like, well, the idea will come to you. Like, I, I feel like kind of a fraud, but and yet I know for myself, the idea will come to them like the second they step out of the classroom or when they're in the cafeteria or where there's someplace else, they're gonna end up getting some um, some kind of an, an idea. When I, go, um, when I go to school visits in the old days, <laughs> two months ago, um, I found that it was really helpful to even just talk to the kids and encourage them, anyone who was interested in reading or writing, to find like-minded people, because I don't think it's ever too young to start having kind of a, a critique group, a makeshift critique group or a book club. Because so I think just talking to other writers and readers really can inspire you a lot and have a nice sounding board. Give and take is good. So Nicole, and I have two, oh, go, ahead, go ahead. I have two quick ideas. So if you're stuck for time, because honestly the best thing to come up with new ideas or to get unstuck is a little bit of time and space and distance. But if you don't have time, my two big ideas are brainstorming like 25 to 30 things and like truly brainstorming, like no judgment, like put down whatever, it's not stupid, it's fine. And by the time you get to 25 or 30, because that's a long list, you may come up with the thing that you want. Or if you can't, if you don't want to do that, you could write down 10 things that you knew, know do not happen. And sometimes we're thinking about like, I'm not interested in that, I'm not interested in that, you will gravitate towards the thing you are interested in. All right. Um, I just thought also of um, Patty Dan's book, The Butterfly Hours. It's like a memoir writing book, but it's just like a list of words pretty much in, in her, you know, in the back she has this list of words that are just these quick write or flash writing type of words that you can get started with. So you just hearing you say that made me think of that book. So I'll go to, I'll turn to that when I'm to help my students. Um, so let's talk about the R word revision um, because that is a tough sell. Uh, it's a tough sell. And maybe perhaps you could also talk about your peer groups or your writing groups that you're in and how um, they might help you to revise a little bit, share some stories. I actually love revisions. Um, it, it's my favorite part of the process. I like it way more than, than drafting the first. Um, um, but the first thing I always tell, like when I do school visits and I talk to the students, I, the first thing I say is that, you know, you have to be open to revisions. I've always been open 100% to trying everything. Um, and if it doesn't work, then you just don't use it. Um, but I'm always willing to try and to play around and for me, it's, you know, you, you've created this world and these characters and the more you get to revise, the more you get to play in this world and see, you know, how, how they would react, how these characters would react to things, what puzzles fit together. Um, but of course, it's, you know, when we're talking about research and revision, it's not always the most uh, fun. Um, for, for I, I always brings to mind two moments with my one editor. Um, when I was working on my second book in the role of Brie Hutchins, this one, um, it, every chapter starts with a new soap opera scene um, and each soap opera scene correlates with what's going on in the chapter. 
And while I was working on it with my editor, she kept breaking my chapters into more chapters. So I had to find more soap opera scenes, which on the one hand sounds like a lot of fun because I get to watch a whole lot of soap opera scenes like on YouTube and stuff, trying to find all these old crazy scenes. But on the other hand, it's, you know, it's like, how do I find another scene where, you know, this ridiculous thing with the mom happens or you know this ridiculous thing happens um that fits the chapter and so i watched a lot of soap opera scenes um but so that was you know every time she split a new a chapter into another chapter i like had a panic attack i was like why are you doing this to me um so that was that was you know a lot of difficult revision work um and then in my third book which will be out next spring um my editor wanted me to ramp up the amount of uh, astronomy and space facts. And I'm, I am not a science, I never was a science kid. So I had to do a lot of, a lot of research there on things that I had no idea about, um, and things that I had to find. And then even in my first book, each chapter, and I will never do anything with chapters ever again after, after this. Um, but my first book, each chapter is a different Van Gogh painting. And when I, again, adding more chapters and stuff or deciding to do that in the first place, each, you look up painting Van Gogh paintings and they're all kind of just named for whatever it is. So it'd be like two shoes or like, you know, a chair and trying to make those fit. So, you know, revision, especially when research is involved can be tedious and difficult and frustrating. But when you finish it, it's it's really satisfying to be able to have everything kind of come together. So for me, that's kind of, you know, <laughs> is it frustrating? Yes, but the end goal is really exciting. Um, Fall, falling down oh. the soap opera rabbit holes, right? Like you figure, <laughs> you never thought that revision would require you to go watch soap operas, right? Or anything no. like that. Yeah. No, and then I kept like watching a scene and then letting it, and then I needed to see what happened next. So I would like totally get completely off track because I just start watching soap operas. That's like how many hours went by, but this <laughs> is work. It's legit. It's legit. Oh my goodness. All right. So sorry, Josh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, sure. So I, I was again going to echo Nicole a little bit by saying that I also really, I, I revisions are hard, but I, in some ways really prefer them to the actual drafting process. And to combine it with something Rajni said before, one of my absolute favorite things, and, and it's because, and I'll, and I'll do what we did before, it's because Seventh Year versus the Galaxy is, it's a, it's a wacky book. It's supposed to be funny. I hope it's funny. The second one I think is, is awesome and even better. The second one, as I keep telling people because I'm so excited about it, features a stand-up comedian robot who I can't wait um, for kids to meet. But my favorite part about the revision research drafting process is populating some joke or line or something that a kid says with a, a for me a margin comment that has a dozen different versions of what that kid could be saying in a particular moment and then i just like choose the funniest one and sometimes i'll use the others and sometimes i won't and it will not i i have a, a great hope that maybe somewhere i can choose all the rejected jokes for like my robot stand-up comedy routine but that's for something else um and and also in, in the second book, because I'm thinking about it now as, as I'm in the tail end of revisions, combining it with the, the research element, the kids are supposed to be relatable seventh graders, even though they're, they're in space on this wacky adventure, they're in school, they're going to class, and so they're studying for an astronomy test, and their teacher is, is really making them memorize the arms of the Milky Way galaxy. And again, I, I want it to be real and not wrong, but I also want it to be how a kid would approach it and so the kids are just like arguing back and forth of their favorite mnemonic devices to remember yes. the yes. arms of the galaxy and I, I pulled it up so here, here's my favorite one it's three purple ninjas outwitted nine scary carnivorous octopi and you can look it up the first uh, <laughs> the first letter of that is accurate to the arms of the galaxy um, and so it's, it's kind of stuff like that it's it's brainstorming like like Rajani said it's it's um, using the the revision process to inspire the just the love of, of the characters and the storytelling and i love that the idea of layering possibilities within revision you know so you have these kind of comments to yourself these notes to yourself of what the possibilities could be and then you end up going back once you have this bigger picture a greater understanding or what have you when you do those notes do you do them like hard copy scribbled into the margin or do you do them like inserting comments in the in the 
document? I, I personally tend to do at first margin comments. I, I am not a Scrivener acolyte, although I a little bit wish I, I was. Mm -hmm. But at some point I do, and maybe this, maybe this makes me old fashioned, I don't know, I, I do print out the whole thing and I'll mm -hmm. scribble all over the place and then I'll print it out again and, and, and do it over and over yeah. again. So it's a combination of both. Awesome. I'm such a nerd for asking that question, I know, but I just had, oh, to, no. I just had to know. All right. I, um, I actually think that, so I love revision also. Oh, woo! Unlimited minutes. <laughs> woo -woo. Um, I, I also love revision, like way more than drafting. Drafting is just excruciating and painful for me, but I just get through it because at the end, you'll have something that you can revise, and I love revising. Um, so what I will say is that um, it, early on in my writing career, when I was writing a novel, I wouldn't really know like what the theme was, what I was really, really, really getting at um, until I completed a draft. And then I'd be like, oh, that's what this book is about. Okay. And then I would go and like, you know, figure out how to bring that out. Lately, um, the theme has come to me in the beginning when I think of the story. And I'm like, oh, I know what this story is about. This is like about this. And this is, and I often know exactly where I'm ending. And then the process is all figuring out how to get to that ending. And often I'm not talking about, so sometimes I know like literally the last line of the book, but I'm also talking about even if you don't know that, the feeling that you want to end with. So I'm like, oh, okay, I know what I, I'm writing towards that feeling. So all of this up and down leading up to that needs to end with that. So for me, my favorite part of revision, once you've figured out like the plot and all that kind of stuff, is to try and make every word, phrase, sentence, paragraph, chapter, lead, point more towards the themes that I'm, I'm driving at. And, um, and that's really fun for me. And like Josh, I find that changing font and changing uh, the medium um, with which I'm viewing the book really, really helps me. So um, I work in a, a program called Scrivener, but then when I'm revising, sometimes I will go back and forth and take sections and put it into Word. It will compile it into Word and I will change the font in Word. But my favorite thing to do um, is to print everything out, is to print it out and then write in the margins. And like my favorite times are when I'm like, this is boring. <laughs> because if I'm finding it boring right now, then God help the poor child that is going to have to read it. So I'm like, no, 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 we need to fix this before it gets to any children. Um, yeah, so I find that changing the way that I look at something literally helps me change the way that I look at something. And reading aloud, that also helps too. Font, font changing is magic. For sure. So Naomi, how about you? What do you think uh, in terms of revision tips, secrets, things like that? Uh, yeah, I've been thinking a lot. Every time someone says something, it kind of makes me think of something else I could say, but then I don't. Because <laughs> <laughs> also, you know, they're, everyone's great. Um, for me, I guess, since I'm not a pantser, I like to plot as much as I can mm -hmm. and then change things as, as needed, of course, every time I revise. But I was thinking about in Super Jake, there's a character who is autistic and my son had special needs, but he wasn't autistic. And so I had to research how autistic children behaved or could behave. Mm -hmm. And I had, luckily I had a friend who works with autistic children who actually had worked with my son too. And she, because of Jake, she became a special ed teacher, which I think is amazing. Oh. Um, but as I went through the book, I knew I had figured out what, how he, this child would behave and how it fit into the storylines. But then when I had to revise it, there was a whole new scene that I wanted him to be a, an important part of. And then I had to do more research because it, I had to see what he could do within that scene that was realistic. And then I would have my special ed teacher vet everything to be sure it was accurate. So it does change. As far as um, Scrivener, I don't know anything. I'm old school. But I, I do everything longhand, and I like to cross out and point and, and arrows and A's and B's and C's, and it's a big mess, hieroglyphics. But what I'm doing right now is I'm writing a book about four girls, sort of a traveling pants homage for tweens. Mm -hmm. And every girl has their own character, their own color, ink. And so when I do that, I'm writing in different colors. I switch, and I, it helps me get in that girl's headset. And then when I, when I do my little graph with my post-its, each post-it represents a different girl, so I can just at a glance see, oh, that's too much of that character, got to. Got to put one in there, and it's, it just helps me visually. So that's that's 
so interesting too, in terms of just finding that balance, you know, that you've got it right there in front of you. That's it. So you were talking about post-its, which also makes me think about just like notes and notebooks. Um, you know, one of the things I'm really missing right now with uh, my classes, first of all, I'm just missing going to work. Um, a day of like learning, remote learning with my four children at home is like so much harder than the 125 students I have <laughs> at work. Oh my goodness. But anyhow, um, I'm really missing um, the daily writing that we would do in our writer's notebooks, like the actual physical writer's notebooks. Um, and my own time to write because I would write with the students. And now that's like the first thing that goes out the window pretty much every day. I haven't had that much time, but um, what does your notebook look like? Is it digital? Is it physical? Is it tiny? Is it, you know, like a plain old composition one? Or are you one of those, you know, fancy, fancy notebook people? Tell us a little bit about that. I don't know. I don't, it's funny because when I was younger, um, my my origin story as a writer is uh, I when I was little I saw the movie Harriet the Spy um, on Nickelodeon and she has her com you know her marble composition notebook um, and after I saw that movie I always every time my parents went to a grocery store I'd need them to buy me another one to fill with stories and whatnot um, but I actually don't have a physical notebook anymore um, I haven't in a really long time I actually find that if it gets too messy or anything, it like drives me nuts. So I can't handle the idea of a physical notebook where I can't just delete things um, or start over or, or fix things. Um, so anytime I'm working on a story, I have like one, one word document. And if I need to take notes, I'll like open a drafts in Gmail and just like jot down little notes um, and things like that. But yeah, I don't, I actually don't have a physical notebook. Um, the notebooks that I have have like Every, I only ever use them if I need to like take notes while I'm on the phone or something. Um, but other than that, everything that I do, I keep mostly digital. Oh, I'm well, also digital. Oh, oh go yeah, ahead. no, go ahead, Reggie. <laughs> I wish I were one of those people that had like a lovely writer's notebook, but in case you missed it earlier, I am a doctor and I cannot even read my own handwriting. So like if I take notes by hand, I need to immediately transcribe them into some kind of typed format because otherwise I will not be able to tell what in the world I was talking about, you know, two days later. So uh, yeah, everything I do is digital. Also, I generally start taking notes in a Word document, but sometimes then I then put that into like a research folder in Scrivener. Um, and um, with the last project I was working on, thoughts with thoughts often came to me when I was driving in a car that just is kind of the way it goes. So I would dictate all my thoughts into my phone while I was driving. I'd be like, rah, rah, rah. I used to take a video of like my chin um, because I didn't <laughs> know you could dictate into anything. And my children mocked me just mercilessly about that. So then I was like, okay, I'm sorry. I will, I will dictate and, and listen to my recording and then type it down. And then the notes app on my phone also helps too. So like I will have a thought and like, before I get started in the car, I'll just type a bunch of ideas down and then and then move on. Yeah, I'm terrified of losing ideas, which happen already all the time. And, and so I need, even if I would love to have also a physical book, which I also romanticize a, a ton. Um, I have, a, for, for each project, I have a single Google Doc that you know, I can access in my email or on my phone. And that's where all the, old rejected scenes are. That's where lines of dialogue that eventually I take out of a draft because a book is done and I, I throw in there somewhere in, in different sections. That's where I keep track in only because I'm, I, I'm, I'm such a nerd that I'm a nerd about being a nerd and, and, I, and I'm proud about that. In addition to, to Seven the Universe of the Galaxy being about space, and this is something I think everybody else on the call knows, all the kids' last names are are inspired by US Supreme Court cases with some connection to the character because I'm a lawyer. And again, that has nothing to do with really the book necessarily. It's never spelled out anywhere, but there's a giant spreadsheet of US Supreme Court cases, the court's ultimate holdings, and, and, and then the, the character. And also like some of them are spoilers for books that haven't even come out yet. So, um, so there's a lot to keep track of. And if I had multiple, even electronic files, I would just lose stuff all over the place. And so that's, that's how I keep track. I feel like we should get like an author panel of, of like attorneys together between it's like <laughs> you, 
Gay Palsner, who else? Jeff Zentner, Alan Eskins. There's so many different authors that I have heard of. Oops, that's my five minute warning. Um, that that I've that I've heard of the, whose works that I've studied that are that are also attorneys. I mean Yeah, I've I've met a few and, and I've said to them, I would love I'd love a like mm -hmm. author lawyer conference because I love writer get togethers. Yeah. Um, and and I don't necessarily yeah. love like a giant conference room just of lawyers doing lawyer things. Yeah. So so if I if I was in a room of both of those, I think I think I'd be pretty happy. And, and we'd be yeah. all just geeking out together. Because uh, like Gay Posner said, it was it was so interesting because even if she was in family law and the people in her firm would want her to be like writing would want her to do some of the writing of the briefs because she could tell the stuff like it was a story, right? So she's like, that That was, you know, it, anyhow. Okay, I'm bird walking again. So Naomi, <laughs> any other, any advice about a notebook? I feel like you're the old school notebook person. Are you like- Absolutely, that's why I used the four different colors of ink and all that, like I said before. So yeah, I didn't chime in because I felt that I had explained it all. <laughs> of course, no, I hear you. And I think like part of me, I wish that I could be that, like I have my notebook with me like that, like the seed idea notebook and what have you but I have like two or three of them in my purse and some of them have my grocery list and some of them have like notes from parent teacher conferences and yeah. everything else um so this makes me feel a lot better about not having like a robust writer's notebook thank you everyone not that that was the objective of the panel but it's <laughs> super helpful um so final thing that I that I want to ask you um for us to close either can you tell us um advice that we could give to a young writer who is who feels like they can't write fiction right or tell us about a teacher that made a difference in, for you as a writer okay so no pressure we only have three minutes it's gonna be like the espn like you know around the horn type of thing all right go ahead nicole go <laughs> um so i want to i'm gonna do i'm gonna do the advice for for um student who doesn't think that they can write fiction. Um, my advice is to just try. Um, I know that sounds very basic, but even my advice for writer's block, which kind of goes hand in hand with, oh, I can't do this, I can't do that, is just sit down and just start writing. And even if, you know, take, set aside 20 minutes and just say, I'm going to write and do nothing else for that 20 minutes. Even if the first 10 minutes of that ends up being, you know, total garbage and you could, you're like, this isn't a story, this is terrible. At some point you might hit your stride or get an idea while you're just trying to get stuff down on paper. And then you'll realize that, oh, there is a story in this. Even if, you know, I've done 20 minute sprints where the first 18 minutes is total garbage and cannot use makes no sense but then that last two minutes i finally find the story um or figure out what i want to write or have an idea even um after getting everything out you know all that it kind of gives you permission to get every all your worries and all the bad ideas out before you kind of finally hit that stride so that's always my advice for those those sort of moments and those sort of feelings of not being able to do something thank you Anybody else? I would say if you want to be a writer of fiction, then you need to read fiction. Mm -hmm. And I think the fiction itself is often so inspiring. You're not going to plagiarize, but it can give you ideas. And you can even read a chapter or two and get and choose your favorite character in the story and write in that person's voice. Or you could start off where the chapter leaves off and what would you do here? And it would make, be a nice springboard for you to just keep going, at kind of like a head start. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, uh, I, I was just gonna say that even if you're having trouble writing, I, I'm sure you're not having trouble loving something, right? Everyone loves some story in some in some venue. So I, I love space stories. I love funny, humorous narratives. So I wrote a wacky space story. My my first, I remember it, my first novel, I was in fifth grade, it was a novelization of the Super Nintendo game Death and Return of Super, Superman because I loved Super Nintendo games. So if, if you love Minecraft, write a story about your travels in Minecraft. If, if, you're, if you stayed up all night thinking about what happened to Ezra Bridger at the end of Star Wars Rebels, write your own fan fiction and, and fit it in there. there. There is so much that can spark wanting to think about a story and wanting to think about a story is really the first step of writing something. Thank and, you. I can, and I can talk a little bit about um, a teacher that made a difference in my life. 
So um, I loved to write when I was younger uh, in school, and but I also knew from a pretty young age that I wanted to go into medicine. And so I remember being in high school, and I had I was in a creative writing class, and I was enjoying myself. But I told my teacher, I said, "Look, I really enjoy this, but this is not what I'm going to be doing um, as my career." And he said to me, Mr. Hertzfeld, I will never forget. He said, "Who says you have to choose?" And he showed me, he brought in all these books by doctors who were also writers. And it was so inspiring to me. And it literally, it like planted a seed in my brain. And years later, when I finally like went through all the med school residency practice stuff and my kids were a little bit older, that seed sprouted. And I was like, I wanna be creative again. And what am I gonna do? And I went back and started taking classes and it was because of that teacher. And he, you know, made me, see that I could leave the possibility open that I could do more than one thing. And, and I, that, that I was say, possible. You know, with authors like, like you, I.W. Gregorio, right? Colette Hassini, people who, you know, it's great to be able to show that to students, right? To be able to say that you can be a writer at, at any point in your life, you can write. All you need to do to be a writer is to write right? Um, yes. But that the, you can pursue this passion, you can pursue this career, but the, the writing, will, the possibility for writing is always, always going to be there. Well, I cannot thank you all enough for giving us the gift of your time and your talent. Um, and I cannot wait to share this with other educators, not just in New Jersey. I think the great, the good part about this is that this can go out to the world. So we are so, so excited and so, so grateful mm -hmm. to all of you. Thank you so much. And how many times can I say so? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And this we're so going to watch this very, very soon. So we'll let you know when it when it goes out. All right? Well, thank you. All right. Wonderful. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.